Um, in reality, we know that this might be total garbage at the boundary of type and fractal. Um, and then we're going to imagine that, okay, so if this is pushing to x, and then we imagine we make sense of some Taylor moduli space in the mirror, that we're going to hope this looks approximately the same. Uh, and then the way we're actually going to prove theorems is we're going to find some little local neighborhoods here, some matching points. And again, they can be formal local neighborhoods, not local form. Uh, and we're going to prove some correspondence here. And this is going to be called our mirror map. And we know, in simple, in all the famous examples, we know that that's actually where you can solve the compute. It's usually some highway transit general formula in practice. Um, and then there's both canonical coordinates down here, and this is the same story. Um, and that's really where we're working. Um, I guess maybe, uh, I guess some examples maybe about complex and Taylor steps we could have. So, I mean, we understand these at least intuitively that complex moduli space, whatever it is, it should come from Bogomolity on through uh, constructing this theorem. Bogomolity tells us that this thing at this point exists in some nice variety locally. Um, it doesn't really tell us anything about global structure. Definitely doesn't. Um, and then this is going to be whatever I mean by a complexified Taylor moduli space. I mean, it's going to be something that's associated to the Taylor form, some of Taylor classes of whatever form that you're taking. Um, so, I mean, the problem, well, there's a lot of problems, I guess, proving things in homological symmetry or whatever. Um, one problem that's just kind of, you know, it's still saying this, but I mean, this is hard. Um, and the thing that's hard about it uh, specifically is that we know essentially nothing about the global structure of the moduli, complex moduli of three folds and n folds and body L. Um, so somehow this is always kind of a picture you piece together locally, kind of patch by patch. Understood thing. Um, and then, I mean, vice versa, I think Taylor comes to seem a little less threatening, but uh, you know, vice versa. We don't know much about the Taylor cone, the Taylor moduli space, uh, because there's this power law of Morrison. It's a KM cone conjecture. Uh, which is essentially used in here, so make sure you first is also predictive of this fairly complicated object. Um, so what do we do? I mean, you know, how do we actually like write papers and prove theorems and stuff? So I mean, one thing you can do is drop down to K threes or something like that, where actually you do have better global understanding. Um, maybe I'll say a little bit, but that's not really what I'm doing here. Uh, so in practice, in your day to day life, and like in the first example here, I'm sure it looks at uh, what we do is what I call like a, uh, let's see, uh, say a torus process. So what I mean by that, so what do we usually do is so we take x from the body L that we're interested in, and we realize that as a hypersurface or complete intersection inside the fourth variety, let's say x is a hypersurface. Okay. So nice, nice meaning mild continuum. Uh, towards <laughs> And then what are we going to do? Um, so first, uh, there's a couple things we can do. So if you're in this situation, uh, we can understand x check by a combinatorial method and that's your Morisov construction. Um, but I mean, more to the point, what I'm saying is that we can uh, start looking at just like the torus parts of these structures here. So we can look at uh, complex moduli deformations of x, which are restricted from its embedding d e by moving its linear system. Uh, and we can look at Taylor forms uh, in the torus variety restricted to x. OK? Um, so I guess you know, the point here for the idea uh, is that these complex Taylor moduli sense for the toric variety for P delta are going to be very simple, at least by some standard 
simple, but it should say explicit. Um, Um, and in particular, they're going to be uh, including local structure. Question? Yes. Um, so the Keller mod the spring in Keller moduli, I mean, what do you mean very explicit? I mean, right, we don't really have a good general definition of what it is, right? So I don't mean springy moduli is too fancy. I mean, I mean just like the, the Keller. I mean, complexified Keller is all I'm saying. Uh -huh, okay. Maybe it's so the local complex. structure near the large complex structure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I don't mean there's no stability definition. For, I mean, like philosophically, I wish there were, but you know, that's that's hard. Um, uh, so yeah, including the global structure and including the boundary is what I'm going to discuss later. So this kind of little cartoon picture we can actually make explicit here for the amine form, right? Um, and then I'll probably just kind of iteratively over time kind of keep hacking at this stuff in more detail. Um, for now. For now, so I mean, to respond to what you were saying, uh, when I say Kaler moduli space, the torque variety, I mean something extremely combinatorial in particular is going to be some torque variety that's associated to this. So this is Alexeyev's moduli stack of stable polarized structure. Um, so I'll, I'll say more about that later. But right now I just want to say, OK, there is, for the torque case, there is some version of this compactified complex moduli space in the geometric universal family. Space you're constructing and the full modular space clear? I mean, oh, I should say so. Maybe, yeah. The first, I mean, there should be mirror symmetry happening here. So if I did this for P delta and then I did this for P delta check where I made some reflexive dual, which is just one circle, then um, at the level of combinatorics, these should be the same, you know, say equal. That's the, the underlying part, right? So part stack should be. There's kind of an, a model B model discrepancy, um, which is that this guy here has a universal family. Um, so there's some family of, well, in this case, part varieties or part varieties with some extra decorations on it, um, actual like a flat family. And there's not really in any, any easy sense a really uh, universal family that this thing has over here. So, so let's you identify here globally some version of the model of killer with complex, which yeah, means yeah. you have implicitly you have your mirror map. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the mirror map here is like really simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a little cheating what I'm doing, but it, it works for most stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, you're allowed to like be mad at me because like, I'm avoiding talking about the mirror. But um, I mean, with the mirror map in this case, it would be transcendental. Yeah, yeah, it would be. But it won't matter for the things that we'll do. Is the point? Um, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's a good point. Uh, 
So there's these kind of modulized spaces here, but yeah, you should imagine that really you're also doing some separate thing where you're building the local identification for their uh, their boundary points of the state. But depending on the statement you're going to probe, that might not actually matter that much in terms of um, script and um, Okay, so I guess <coughs> maybe then, so any <coughs> symmetry talk should have a possible example. So I just want to kind of point out, you know, again, I think probably most people in the audience have never worked this out at some point. I want to play around with the torus geometry a little bit that is underlying this. Um, so I'm thinking of this guy as the hypersurface in P4. So implicitly, I'm attaching some linear system on P4, so O5, um, that I think of as a section of. And then, uh, so rhetorically, How we describe O5, we describe it by some polytope, which is just a standard simplex of minus 5. Oh, is this too small? You can um, say yeah, I think so. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe. No, but, you know, yeah. you changing, yeah. I've been using this for many times. So it should be here. Okay, yes, I think Ryan told me that. Yeah, you should be here. A little bit bigger? Yeah. Like, order two? Order three? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. That's so, a tiny bit bigger. Example. <laughs> That's good. Okay. So, there's our quintic. All right. So, this corresponds to a polytope delta. Simplex. So let's you know let's not draw that. Let's draw like a smaller version. So we are doing instead a cubic elliptic curve, and we would have some standard simplex here. Okay. Uh, and then there's this Bautier construction, this reflexive polytope stuff, uh, which tells you to look at the polar dual of this polytope, which is the convex hull. Draw like the lower dimensional version of this, then we would that picture there is a bunch of little triangle. Um, and then, so what's the point? So, uh, if we look at P delta circ, there's this thing which is either like awesome or really annoying, depending on your perspective. Um, so, this is some torque variety associated to this polytope, it's singular, uh, and it ends up itself being an orbital of motion before. G, G here. I'm, I'm not going to remind you of how it works exactly, but it's some P5 cubed. Uh, the only reason I say it's annoying is because there's kind of different opinions on what you might think the mirror family is or how you should write it out. So you can write it out just in P4, which I guess is what I'll do. So mirror family, that's my tick. given by writing out some hypersurfaces and some equations. <coughs>
some parameter psi, sometimes it's over five psi, whatever. Okay. So we take some hypersurface there, we pop in, we vary the psi, which is going to be our complex parameter here. Um, yeah, so I can either, you know, the way I wrote this, it looks like it's in P4. So you can work up in P4 and then remember that you should have this group action acting fiber-wise on this family. You can pass to the quotient, then everything becomes singular. You can resolve the family in some toric way, and then, you know, we'll all argue about the nicest way to think about it. But it doesn't really matter that much, kind of thing, I'll say. Um, one thing I do want to draw a little attention to later potentially. Um, I, so I'm basically saying I, I don't want to worry too much about the you know stacks and groups and orbitals and stuff. Um, there's this extra Z5 action uh, which for later use might be a little important for my life um, which is just really simple like this is going to let X I go to U X I Um, so these previous automorphisms here, uh, which I didn't write out, but uh, these guys will act fiber-wise on the family, so I can just take the quotient of this family fiber-wise by G, and you know, I'm just working with different fibers over the same phase. Um, this guy sends uh, X psi to X times U psi, uh, so this permutes the fibers around. Um, so I can take the quotient by this Z5 action, and what I'll get is, maybe I guess I should be doing checks on here, family here. Um, I'll get a family, uh, which part do I want to write it out here? I'll just call this the mirror family, say, script X uh, check, uh, which I'm going to be thinking of, okay, I'm taking this family of X size that I had before uh, as a, Tacky notation here, but thinking this is a family and then I'm quotienting it by the Z5 action above. Um, so what am I what do I mean here? Uh, so yeah, I have this family, which I can think of as a family XI check over you can say over C, but I want to say over P1, so just interpret that psi as a parameter of P1. And then this guy's gonna sit over this orbital. Um, so I basically just took the Winnick mirror family and then quotient it by this extra Z5 action. Uh, the reason I want to do that is to collapse the number of singular fibers down. Um, so this is exactly the same as something that happened. It's a slightly shifted version of mirror symmetry here, so related example. So I guess the second most popular Campbell after the clinic is probably the mirror P2, uh, which here you think of as the Planck Ginsburg model W equals MC plus one over X Y. Um, so this guy, you do a little calculation, and this has three singular factors, so it's three critical values. Okay, um, but they lie at roots of unity. You do a little calculation. Um, so I could also play this game where people usually think of this W as it is a function in the G chorus. So I might change this a little bit by uh, introducing some orbital structure here. So I think it's the same thing. Okay. Um, w is the quotient map. Um, the thing that I like about that and why this shows up sometimes is that this bottom map here, this composed map, will have one critical value. So I have one singular fiber. Um, and then the same thing will happen with this quotient of the here family. Um, and then, I don't know, there's, I guess, the inner symmetry heuristic here is like, where's this three coming from? Where's this five coming from? Um, implicitly, like, let's just work with the mirror P2. Uh, when I say that this is the mirror P2, uh, you know, we're implicitly fixing the anti-canonical divisor, which is also anti-canonical, which is O3. Um, so somehow the fact that the canonical divisor has some Fano index, the fact that it's three times an ample class, results in this 
in the tree here. And then the same thing happens up here at the torque station here. Um, where for the ambient torque, right, and then the torque movement, uh, it's just by phi. I mean, essentially it's the ambient conversion in this case over here. Um, so yeah, so I mean, that's maybe kind of a technical point, but uh, I more just want to do that later on, or on Thursday, I might be talking about things having one critical value, and then you like look at it and they don't, and it's because there's some other withholding thing happening. Okay. Um, so what do people, is that cool? Uh, so what do people do with the Quintic family? Well, I guess like a lot of stuff. Pretty famous example. Um, I just want to remind you of one story, which again I think is going to be probably everybody in the audience has thought about at some point in their life. Um, so what's going on with this global structure, this family, and the singular fibers? Um, so maybe spend some time to say the interesting fibers. So the generic fiber, which I guess is its own way interesting, is well, playing on the way I wrote this. It's either another quintic blah blah or quotient thereof. Um, but we've got some other guys that are interesting here. Uh, I'm just going to rewrite the equation so we can point at things. Um, so I guess what's happening here, so I guess most popular, I think the nicest for a lot of reasons here is that psi equals infinity. Uh, so this is kind of like a large complex structure limit for the family. Um, so what's happening here is this degeneration in the really literal sense of the word degeneration uh, to even the coordinate planes. Um, so this is just kind of dominated by this monomial here. So you know, uh, the union for that side which is zero. Um, psi equals one, we get this critical value that I was talking about. Um, so this guy, people like to call this the conical. Um, and so if you kind of play around with this guy, this is uh, not really a degeneration in that sense. So this, has a, this is more like a double point degeneration. So this has some vanishing cycle, vanishing x3. Um, and then there's the reason I said interesting and not singular is because there's something kind of funny going on at side equals zero. So the way I kind of rigged the game here to kind of make it more clear what's going on. So in short, there's nothing going on. Um, at psi equals zero, this is just become kind of nicely. You know, it's just a Fermat quintic. Uh, but I set this up so that it's sitting over the stacking point, which is five. So it looks like a smooth fiber. Uh, but at a stack. Who's 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gethin was a physicist. Is he older or? Is yeah, he, yeah. Yeah. Okay. He just realized that uh, at this point there is independent Um, so what's this, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to do with the story. Um, I mean, the thing I want to draw attention to in the iteratively over time will be generalizing or at least you know, talking about other versions of uh, what, let's draw a little crappy picture here of what the face looks like. Um, so we'll have some point out here, which uh, I'm going to draw at a finite distance at, at infinity. And then I have zero, and then I have one. Um, so if I fix some general fiber, some general point at the base here. Uh, at some point, you're going to start considering monogram transformation around here. So there's a little, in terms of like the structure and the story, I mean, this is a common thing for people to do, but it, it's potentially confusing because this is supposed to be the complex moduli space, but now essentially what I'm doing is regarding it as a symplectic vibration. Um, so it's kind of like a variation stability condition or something. Um, and so I want to consider associated to these guys, I'll consider three monodromy transformations, you know, T0, T1, T infinity, uh, which right now, I am a little want to be a little deliberately big about what am I acting on, but I mean, I could consider this acting on, like in a very geometric sense, I might want to think of this as some kind of symplectomorphism of the fiber, which I guess would be X check, uh, or I might want to think of it as acting by an auto -formosis. I'm just try to get the next check if I just want to be a fairly categorical guy. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, okay, and then the story we want to play is like, okay, at a very naive level, like, okay, I get some more directions here. Um, I should be able to concatenate these loops and I should be inverse to this other loop, right? So very naively, I should have at least just a Uh, then what's going to happen with the monodromy transformations? So I actually don't know the history of this very well, but I've told this in the Kantianism, um, like 96 or something. Um, so uh, he guessed, okay, oh yeah, so the, the extra thing is that, okay, well, if we have homological mirror symmetry, then the Bukaya category should be the derived category for MCs. The original quintic. So we could ask ourselves what's happening here. Uh, so Konstevich proposed interpretations, which is that uh, the large complex structure monodromy should correspond to the auto equivalence. I'm talking about here as auto equivalences of the B model. Uh, so the monodromy transformation over here corresponds to the auto equivalence, which is tensoring by O of one. Uh, the the conifal transformation. This is a little tautological. What I'm going to write um, in the sense that people develop this whole theory exactly to kind of count this example. Um, but this is what's called a spherical twist. So I'll also say that T is conic, uh, but around some spherical object. Structure sheet. So this is a cycle common twist. Uh, the game is to guess, okay, like what is the length of the finite in particular? Um, but in particular here, this is what I call the LOX, this is a spherical object. Uh, I think at this point, I'm going to keep that as the goal for experts that are going to help better. Um, and then there's this kind of, the sense like to me the most annoying part of this is what's happening at this orbital point. Um, so, T0, uh, what's going to happen to this? Um, it fits into some formula, which is that you expect it naively. Okay, this is supposed to be monodromy around the smooth point. So it should be trivial, except it's over a stacky point. So you say there's some orbital monodromy. Which is going to be some sigma T5 action. That group that it's covering. 
Um, so that's what you want to say at first is that this will be some, uh, this will correspond to uh, something that's to the fifth power as the identity. But then that's not quite true. It ends up being shift by two. Um, so this would be like a good thing to argue about with your, I think a lot of people have this kind of thing that where that shift by two comes from. I, I, I'm going to just leave that to match up with some calculation here. So I mean, just summarizing, because that's really what I want to be friendly here. Um, the two concrete transformations here, T infinity and T1, and the claim is that if I take T infinity and T1 and compose them, take that to the fifth power, that's the shift by two of your archetypal your sheet. Um, and this was, I don't know how computers came up with this, but then, I mean, uh, later people came just kind of brute force uh, verification. So this was F small, which I think first was like uh, to verify it in a real brute force calculation level. Um, the shift by two doesn't depend on dimension of X, does it? X is. Yeah, no, this, I mean, morally, this comes from some. I, I, yeah, am I allowed to ask the audience like questions? Does anybody have an opinion on the shift by two? I know other people have like encountered this. I don't know. It's usually understood by. Uh, Should we do the monotony and the big loop around? Yeah, but why two? Yeah. It's like okay, uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, no, I didn't want to start the whole thing No, but I mean the five is like very clear where that's coming. Is it obvious with the multiplication of all these big? That's the monotony and the big loop going around. Yeah. So yeah, okay. So the question is, that's uh, that's like a Sarah functor, right? It's like a kind of infinite monotomial lambda Vinsberg model. But then this isn't three, even though we're on the question. That's, that's what I was asking. What's the dimension? Oh yeah, yeah. I think I think this one's this okay, yeah, yeah, this isn't a good thing to be answered. My personal opinion is that it's three minus one, where three is because it's the Sarah functor, and one is you lose a factor. Coming from the fact that we're embedded inside P4, we're just going to have to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, that's like the cool story, I think. And I mean, people have thought a lot about ways to generalize it or put it in other contexts or whatever. Uh, I mean, a few things to point out is. I mean, where's this come from? You just like this is stupid, uh, but symplectomorphisms don't act by category graded symplectomorphisms. Yeah, yeah. Act, and you need to caution out by shift by two if you take symplectomorphism because there is ambiguity in the choice of the lift, right? So, so, so I think maybe there is like a problem with like what the monotomy is actually acting like your extra choice of like lift to graded symplectomorphism or something. Um, right? So and you're saying there's something a little dodgy just about even. I mean, the symplectomorphism just doesn't directly act from our book. Symplectomorphism yeah. lifted with like a choice of graded symplectomorphism. Yeah. Act. yeah. So, which one of these you chose, like a grading, like a lifted, like symplectomorphism graded, and maybe I think like with the monotony of your choice. Like, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I agree. But, I mean, I think maybe one thing is just, I would kind of want to wash my hands of these issues um, in the sense that. Uh, these formulas, like this this particular formula right here, is proved purely within the B model, usually. It's done by kind of like saying, okay, I'll just compute these equivalences and do some calculations, you know, point around for you, factors and stuff. Um, it's not really done by actually proving where it's supposed to come from yeah, yeah. and doing that. So, uh, and then I guess, you know, as time drags on here, maybe probably more on Thursday, I'll try to say a little bit more about kind of how I like to think about this Topology, this vibration, but somehow this is a story that kind of emerged just purely inspirationally. Yeah, you cannot define the sky category outside like this small. Uh, yeah, that's another that's, thing, that's, right? That's it's what, what, totally dodgy, right? Because, yeah, I just said, okay, the sky category is defined on a non club field, yeah. and I'm not that thing around here, but then I said, okay, you can extend the fiber, yeah. yeah. So, can I just ask you, Ben, are you at this point that Am I ready? Like, At this very second, I'm I, think, yeah. I want to know. So, this homological new symmetric conjecture. Yeah. Um, so the, the drive equivalence, is it completely universally worked out? For instance, can I know what. Okay, I, I think I know what the skyscraper sheet on the B side will be. Yeah, no. Then, what, 
the structure she quoted? What's the well, I shape mean, of a curve? Group? Okay, I felt bad about that shift by two things. You're like really want to start an argument with people. I mean, people in the audience. Well, here, everybody's going to have I'm some version of that. So. I don't know. so what's the state of the art right now? I mean, my opinion, which I, I don't know. I feel like I'm going to offend somebody. I mean, you know, there might be some silly, you know, like people. I don't want to be silly, but like low-dimensional examples where you might just go crazy, you know, and somebody's freaking out. You prove homological mirror symmetry by finding generators for the category. Uh -huh. That's how it's done in every example. And so the short answer to your question is no. If, if you have some weird generating set, you might have to do a lot of work to figure out where your line bundles go to. Or your you know? You told you your I mean, uh, I think the side of I think the I can't remember. But the, oh yeah, there's the, some. The side you, of you, Thomas Twist is about supposed to be if you have an S ring calibration. I think the volume transfer base is getting like as much as the T one. So maybe I think that should be the base of the S ring calibration. Okay, yeah, there should be. There's some universal statement that you'll be able to make. Yeah, so like not verified though. Yeah, so there's philosophically universal statements you should be able to make. Like, yeah, like you're saying, like I mean, the structure sheets should always. Be this and you can usually control like where a certain line has to line up. So the structure sheet was also good for understanding the Yeah, yeah. Um, so both of these slides were the slides were useful. Both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, where's the structure sheet that's going to I don't think it's out. Yeah, I don't know if it's clear that this one is for you, especially not your class. I mean, it's like the vanishing cycle for this thing, right? So, yeah. I mean, you can pretend like it's there. But you can see it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, this stuff matters a lot too, right? Because you know, when you're working in more specific context, you're going to throw, you know, you're going to say the Bukaya category. But then, for compact guys, everything will just follow through. But for other variations, you might have a quiz, and you might have to have different variations on it. And a lot of times, the difference in variation is okay. I picked a model for the Bukaya category because I want these generating objects. And then you might have kind of different versions of mirror symmetry for the same space that should all be conjectural to a more individual structure. That'll show up later, even just in the context of hard drives. It'll show up at some point where, depending on what you want, it's like either drawn in a theorem or it's still open. You have some model for the category you want. Um, I think maybe one point that's worth adding is that uh, the, the in principle uh, you you could write down so let let's say in the context of uh, pouring the yeah. hypersurface yeah, yeah, yeah. you you there's a formula for the period yeah okay and from that formula you can you can work out a basis for the period and therefore. Uh, talk about the, the, the model draw me as an operator on the space, you know, spanned by the... Oh, case. like like on K-theory or something like that? Well, on some VR3 or yeah, higher yeah. dimension. Yeah. Okay. And um, the, the the period is associated, I mean, there's a function called V-series uh -huh. uh, that we wrote down, you know, with Hasono and Yao in, yeah. in 94 that associate to period uh, homology classes of the mirror. Right, right. The homology classes are, are, are nothing but coming from turn classes of these uh, objects in the drive category mm -hmm. of priority. Mm -hmm. So from that formula, at least in the context of for mirror symmetry, there's a reliable guess mm -hmm. what these objects are in the drive category. Okay. So yeah, that's for a good example, point. you know, it tells you where the structure sheets go, yeah. where line bundle goes, and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah, uh, admittedly, those are a few guess, but that's a very concrete uh, dictionary. Yeah, that okay. one can actually write down. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. I think the only thing I, I'd say is that there's kind of conflict in the sense that, like, I mean, uh, uh, step away from one second. I mean, I mean like, uh, like, if you take like the mirror for P two, you'll have three vanishing cycles. But then there's always a question about which objects they correspond to. I mean, they correspond to three exceptional yeah. objects in the object I mean, category. What, but what figuring these, out what this model from the operator lift to the, the category level, like Kaya or symplectic, yeah. that, that's now under investigation. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to work it out. Okay, yeah. so that's a good point. Yeah, I kind of I live in the homological world. 
So yeah, it's just for it's one. Um, all right, so wh where do I want to go from here? Um, so yeah, I mean basically just this, this story about this monodromy relation that sort of mirrors some mon monodromy relation on the text I said. I kind of want to think about other contexts where you can understand that. Um, so uh, I mean one direction which I'm not going to get into in particular, I don't think I'm going to state it completely properly. Um, so, I mean, one direction is you say, okay, well, you say, okay, well, let's go down to K3 surfaces where things are a little, a little more explicit here. Um, and I mean, the main business here is this conjecture of bridge length, which is attracted a lot of attention. Um, so, Simon, can I also? Yeah. Sorry, I, I interrupted. Yeah. So, just also curiosity. Now, this the thing that Bob was saying yeah. is a way of leading off this K three classical model. Yeah, yeah. Which came with it. So is there a statement that, for instance, at least guarantees that certain Lagrangian in the Fourier side goes to a sheet, but not a complex with twenty seven terms in it? Because you might, in principle, have complexes and the alternate in some of the churn characters equals the churn character of O. So how do yeah, you know? Yeah. In this example, they are all single objects. They are, they are, I mean, they can be represented. You're in the derived category, right? right? Every object is represented by, you know, infinite number of ways. But the point is that uh, they are, they're oh, sort okay. of a canonical so basis. It's quasi isomorphic to There's a canonical uh, basis where these, oh, these okay. uh, objects are, are associated to a single, a single yeah. term. Then this I can is, think of it this is it. supposed to be a shift in the B field. This is supposed to be the base of the SVD permission. I mean, Right. Everything except the stacky point, which I right. probably just okay. don't so know. More or less, have a conjecture. Tells us what it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, there will be some kind of similar context later where it's a little specifically, specifically this question of like what is it represented by a sheet. <laughs> but not in this context, that'll be just a little bit. Um, yeah, so I mean, one variation on this kind of theme here is this conjecture of the bridge line. So if you have x is a k3, uh, and again, I'm, do a, I'm not really getting into this, this is more just for culture here. Um, but uh, the conjecture here is okay, well, we should have some monodromy representation uh, similar to what we talked about over there, um, or here in k3. So let's say pi one, and then maybe some order form here of some Taylor moduli space. Um, so here, uh, I don't want to think specifically in terms of some. There, I was kind of describing it's coming from some ambient torque construction, like maybe a torque case or something. Uh, here, you don't really need these torque crouches that I was talking about. So there's two ways. This is classical and homological again. Um, so, I mean, you can try to understand this first by the so called Bogachev uh, lattice polarized mirror symmetry. So, I should say the base of Bogachev's lattice polarized mirror family. So, if you don't know what that is, it doesn't really matter. This is some you know, very nice kind of construction of mirror families for K3s goes back to the first base of mirror symmetry. Uh, and then, as I think as was asked earlier, uh, there's the kind of high-tech way, which is that you can think of this as the bridge of stability kind of whole on X, maybe it's modular of the of the modular of the of the modular of the modular of the I'm not enough of an expert. I was kind of wondering this. To, to, I've seen the statement made that this, so I mean, you know, the claim is that this should be, again, off of some shifts. I don't want to worry about that. It should be, I mean, auto equivalence is, uh, well, first, maybe it's a tiny category of the mirror. Uh, but then, what you're really interested in is auto equivalence is a direct category of the K3. Uh, I've kind of seen the, 
conjecture stated for either of these kind of types of things in the original form, but uh, uh, that might be kind of, uh, that's a little, uh, this is believed to be the correct one, <laughs> certainly. Um, so, your point is that, really, this is not the your point is that there's an open subset happening here. Right? No, so, the path to the quotient, I think that the most, the kernel, even yeah. the bridge and stability definition, that's supposed to be a definition of the stringy killer space. Yes. Supposed to be an approximation of the stringy color space embedded. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, the conjecture is that this is like you know faithful representation and gives everything that we actually have in equivalence there. But uh, okay. I've seen it for claimed K3s. for Dolgachevian. Specifically for K3s or in general? Because that K3s. I don't know what I, I don't know how ambitious people are with higher dimensions. Because it sounds uh, very strong to say this. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but you don't know anything. For K3s? No, for other. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody's claimed. I, I don't even know if anybody's claimed that faithfulness is that. I, I don't know. Um, so, I mean, this is something. I mean, this is something you work on. Uh, I mean, it's still open. I mean, for uh, paragraph one, K3s were proved by Eric Richland a few years ago, three, four years ago. I don't know if there's been more progress since then. Um, a lot of subsequent work that I won't get into. Um, so that's one direction you can go, and then you don't have to change like any of the spark stuff. Um, <coughs> um, so the other direction, which is more what I've heard more about today. Um, Uh, so we're going to just kind of mimic the Quintic mirror family in more general for our constructions. Um, so let's say I have X hypersurface, or well, maybe a complete intersection, inside some fourth variety. So it's kind of just slide out hypersurface. Uh, complete intersection with inside some fourth variety. Um, to get away from, like, to get new phenomena that's beyond the, the quintic example we have, I, I want to assume that I have some real particular modulo here, uh, even if it's like, let's say there's one more one, bigger than one. Um, so what do I want to do here? Um, I'm sorry for interrupting this question. Have you proved that not the whole conjecture is weak with pi 1 and killer is automorphism of the whole or Roy equals 1, right? It's not the Oh yeah, yeah. Because you need yeah, yeah. So this this is this, this should happen, right? Yeah. So you're saying yeah, be proof. Yeah, and that's that, that I suppose. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of a theme, right? You prove the B model statement that should morally come to the A model statement. Um. So uh, yeah, I mean, so in this more general thing, I mean, this is really uh, uh, something I'd say here. I mean, really, not to the story. Um. Um, so, I mean, the rough idea here uh, is, okay, so again, I'm, I'm going to just use the kind of, I'm going to use the Taylor and complex moduli spaces that kind of come, that come inherited from this part structure, from this part embedding. Um, so the model for Taylor, that I'm going to take, um, I'm going to switch to Taylor language to more birational language just for personal reasons. So uh, the model I'm going to take from Taylor is going to be uh, the torch variety of the effective cone of P sigma, or just combinatorially uh, times the subdivide fan. So there's something I need to clarify here. Uh, so this will be some cone. Some sort of torque, right? Uh, and then also, there's actually a pan here because this guy has a chamber decomposition with its chamber decomposition, which I'll clarify in a second. Um, so, what's the point here? So, uh, if I 
back up uh, divisor D, back to divisor D. Uh, I can form some space. It's just cross section. This is just the section, cross of the section ring, created section ring. Um, and since, well, here I specifically took the hard part idea. I mean, they're like, they're talking about the rational guy. Everything works fine here. It's almost closed. There's not a difference between effective and pseudo effective. We have abundance, so this makes sense. And all that everything's nice here. Um, so we associate some space to a given uh, divisor, you know, for example, if it's already ample, and this would just get back to x. Oh, I shouldn't get back to x. Oh, uh, it'll get back p delta. Um, and uh, the chamber decomposition. So this effective column comes from just saying, okay, well, if I happen to have an xd being isomorphic to xd prime, and if they're in the relative interior subtain column, so this will define the column. Um, so, uh, I mean, this is a really familiar construction of Mori theory. Uh, I don't know, I want to draw some pictures for fun. Well, I've been writing them to my students. I want to draw more. Um, <coughs> uh, so I'll give an example that I like is to, let's take our torch variety D delta, do the blow up. Let's say two points. Okay. Um, so the effective column here is like a basic algebraic geometry exercise here. Um, I mean, there's three effective divisors that you'll pull out pretty fast. Uh, so there's uh, one exceptional divisor, one blow up. There's another exceptional divisor, another blow up. Uh, and then there's the strict transform of a line that goes between the two. Um, and this whole thing here should be sitting inside, sitting inside the R group. Maybe tensor R or tensor Q, uh, which in this example is going to be random three. Uh, so really when I say this, this is my picture for the column here. I mean, this is three-dimensional so right here. Uh, and then what's the chamber decomposition? So I mean, you can just do explicit calculations here, but you know geometrically what, what should happen. Um, so the picture ends up looking like this. And you can guess this just by saying, okay, what are the Mori operations out here? So I have an ample chamber here, which is P delta. Um, and then what can I do with this? Well, I can blow down, right, to F1, blow up at one point. And I can do that in two ways, by blowing down the two points that I blew up. Um, and then these guys both map blowing down again to P2. Uh, and then there's another space up here, which is P1 by P1. And there's that change of ruling too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you get a torque variety, which is going to be associated to this band right here. And I'm going to pretend like that's the Taylor modulus space. Okay. Uh, realistically, it's just purely associated with the band of torque variety. But you have to show marks in there. Okay. Um, so. I mean, there's something you'd want to do here with the kind of structure that I'm given. Um, so geometrically, what are we trying to do? I mean, basically, what I'm proposing here is, OK, uh, as I vary in these chambers here, I'm going to take P delta, and I'm going to replace it by some birational toric variety P delta prime. And then, OK, I have some Kaladi Yao that I started with starting inside here. And what you'd want to try to do uh, is move this over just by you know, composing with this birational map to get somebody inside here. Uh, so a lot of times this will work well, and you can make sense of this. Um, in full generality, this is a little problematic. I don't have a great example of mine, unfortunately. Um, but the reason it's problematic is that x prime might be very singular. So 
this is, sorry, I keep, I have a, I keep bothering Emmanuel for his terminology. So this is, like, is this like a fat hybrid or a fat theory? I, I don't know. There's some, I mean, there's some phases in the GLSM where it kind of can't make sense of it geometrically, right? So. Yeah. It's a little different, but. Yeah, but I'm interested in cases where it gets too singular. Oh, so okay. I don't know if there's I like a preferred. Yeah, yeah, or some kind of hybrid theory. Yeah. Oh no, that's not the one. Um. So this isn't kind of what I'm saying here is that I mean there's a story you're trying to tell which kind of sort of works but not always, and the story is okay. I'm trying to extract Taylor moduli of x, and the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to do birational operations on this ambient space, and then I'll try to just restrict it. And I'm saying that that might result in things that are too singular for you to really make sense of. So you kind of need to work around this somehow. Um, so in your picture, x would be a lot of this thing all the Yeah, that's going to, what I'm going to say is that's the fix, is to do that here. So. Okay, so the kind of correction for this problem here, I, I mean, or correction alternate approach, I don't know if I'm going to say uh, workarounds. Uh, so there's two of them that I'm aware of. They're both popular for different reasons. Um, so one version uh, is the following. So I'll, I'll, I'll go a little quick here. Um, so this x sitting inside p delta um, is supposed to be originally be like a hypersurface, maybe complete intersection. So there's some line bundle of that split vector bundle floating around. So what I might do instead is include this as a zero section inside tote of, uh, I'm just going to write d for vector bundle, but I specifically need the pixel. If you take sections, we'll cut out text. Um, and then what you can do here is same type of story. So I can do uh, Taylor moduli space on here, which I'll say something about in a second. Um, and the thing is that doesn't really change that much. I mean, even the combinatorics is essentially the same. Um, but the thing that's nice here is there's this theorem. Uh, and there's a lot of versions of this theorem, but uh, they are a lot. Uh, which says in this geometric context that the drive category of coherent cheese on X uh, will be given by, so what I'm going to do is I, I've got the space sitting inside this ambient space, which has been included as the zero section inside here. So I'm going to realize the space is the critical locus um, of some, some function. And the way it's going to work here is I'm going to take some super potential, which is going to sum, let me just write it as xi, fi, where I guess I didn't define everything. But these guys are going to be the sections uh, defining x. Uh, and then these are going to be like fiber coordinates. Uh, so if we set that up right, uh, the critical locus for W should contain X. Uh, and then the theorem is that the drive category coherent sheets on X can be described as matrix factorizations, uh, graded matrix factorizations of the super potential on the total space. Okay, And there's a whole kind of general theory for working with these global matrix factorizations when functions on larger things. Yeah? But I feel like I'm so confused now because so used. Like uh, the London Gizmo, Calabria London Gizmo correspondence right now, like because you move this is the yeah. order field, so you move basically yeah. from like the Calabria to London Gizmo to London Calabria. But this is a different moduli space. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, this there's something the a little confused. Okay, a yeah, okay. Bunch of other um, space floating around. Here. There's something a little weird about the way I organize the logic here. I, I agree with that. I think really what I want to say is like let's imagine we know this is one of the corresponding up corresponds. So let's imagine we know this. Uh, then what somebody will say eventually is, okay, let's take this potential 
and just bury it uh, in the Kähler module space here. And then that I can make sense of no matter what. I'll have a matrix, graded matrix factorization of the potential, but on a different space. And I'll get lucky sometimes and be able to use this correspondence to get a geometric theory. Does that kind of answer your question? There's something, I kind of know what you're saying. There's something yeah. kind of funny about that. I'm not saying it out loud. Um, so, yeah, I guess I didn't really write that out loud, but uh, that's basically sort of the proposed fix right here. Uh, is that now I don't have to worry about coherent sheets on four very colorful singular spaces. Now I'll just work with the matrix factorization category for each space. Okay. Um, and in the Claudi Howe case, there will be equivalences and you know, just homework the outside people. Um, and uh, oh yeah, there's also so that that's really like the serious reason for considering this. There's also like a more combinatorial fix for or reason why this is kind of a desirable choice to make, like a choice to start working with these local Kaladi outs instead of the compact guys. Uh, another wall, another benefit of this uh, is that, okay, so uh, my version of the Kähler modulized case I was talking about was saying, okay, I'm gonna take birational models and get this fan for this ambient torus value. And then I said, okay, we can do the same thing up here. Um, so one thing that's nice is uh, this version of the Kähler moduli space that I described, just coming from this birational geometry, extended Kähler moduli space, but done on the total space of P will be uh, projective or compact. Um, so uh, I mean, I, I guess for combinatorial reasons. So I'll give an example in a second. Uh, the reason why I say that's a good benefit is that this should match the complex. Uh, this should match the complex moduli, and you know we saw, e.g., in the Quintic example, that the mirror family uh, had this compactification. So the mirror family was naturally defined over some compact base. Um, so the toric variety that's associated to this version I took over here isn't actually a compact toric variety, right? It's a complex that's a quarter cone. But I'm saying that won't happen when you enlarge these extra spaces, okay? So that's just kind of a structural benefit. So if you did this with the, I mean, what, what do I mean here? If you uh, just work with this for the quintic, then you would just be working with the effective cone of P4, which is one dimensional ray, which is just gonna give you C. So you're going to miss the orbital point there. So anyways, that's another reason to push for this hypothesis model to include the full complex module. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So that's the way people usually work with these singular theories. Um, I said there's like a workaround to this stuff. Um, there's another one. So uh, the other workaround here uh, is to forget about Bobby House, which is maybe a painful for some people. Um, and we're just going to say, OK, we're just going to regard this moduli space that we're talking about, that Taylor, as being Literally, what it was when I took it was the Kähler moduli space of the actual part variety, P delta. Uh, and then this mirror family that we were talking about, this compact, complex moduli space, we'll regard that as the mirror of P, P delta. Okay. So before, what I was saying was okay, we take a, you know, we take a hypersurface at a complete intersection of P delta, we're going to build this mirror family. And that'll have fibers, which are mirrors of that Claudi out. Now what we're saying is, okay, we'll just forget about the Claudi outs. And what I'm really doing is I'm building some mirror family that I can associate with P delta. Okay. So this is some version of model mirror symmetry. And we'll I'll say more about that later. It's just kind of story. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, 
right, so Yeah, so we have to change the game to talk about mirror symmetry for the part by itself. And I'll, I'll get to that later. I mean, that'll be a main thing I'll, I'll, I'll get to. Uh, but right now I'm saying, okay, let's, uh, right now I'm just saying it's okay, we'll try later to think of this as a mirror family to the original part by just by. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure. um, so, I, mean, I don't know, maybe you want me to just kind of summarize. Sorry, that train is hot here. Uh, just at the level of the kind of expectation thing that we have here. Um, so what's the idea here is we're, you know, we're starting again with this x and p delta. Um, and then we're building some Kähler moduli space. So we have this Kähler moduli space, which I'm taking to be this sort of toric approximation. And this is this thing that's encoded by birational models of the ambient space, or of p delta. Chamber decomposition we affected it on. Okay. Uh, and then by a mirror symmetry, we want to alternately identify this as the base of some complex moduli space. Okay. So there should be mirror uh, M complex, which is given by the exact same data up here, so it should be identified. Um, and then what do I want to say about this? So this guy uh, should be his mirror family. This is this thing that I said a long time ago. It's going to be described in this Torah case as Alexei's stable magnification. Um, and just structurally, what do we expect to have here? Um, so it should be compact. We include everything that we've seen. Um, the general fibers. Of this family should be the mirrors x check. Um, because this is supposed to be identified with the Taylor moduli of boundary strata at infinity of this moduli space, should be in some sense in bijection with these birational models we were talking about before. So yeah, so what's like the picture I have in mind here um, is that this should be a higher dimensional version of the Quintic mirror family and that's all that's happening. So since I haven't done like explicit recampos here, I'm just talking structurally again for the sake of the cartoon picture of what we're thinking about. So the picture we had in mind for the Quintic, which is not a cartoon, this is a real thing, but we said we have this guy here. Um, is we have this planned out Ginsberger Geffner point and this conifold point, and then we have this large complex structure limit point. That's the base of the moduli space, and then imagine like universal families, which are just the fibers that correspond to this. Uh, and then the higher dimensional version, at least at our level of expectation, should operate roughly similar. Um, here, the base was P1 or P1 by Z5. So this is the torque variety, which is P1. So in general, what we expect is that the base of our moduli space, the base of our compacted by complex moduli space, is going to be some other torque variety, higher dimension, though, so not like this. So this is some torque variety or torque stack. Um, and what's going to happen here is on the boundary, we should have certain degeneration points. Um, but the point. The thing that's happening is before we just had zero and infinity, uh, Landau Ginsberg and the large complex structure limit. Now we're going to have different phases. So we have different degeneration points corresponding to different birational models at each of those maximal strata. Um, and then the thing I'm actually mostly interested in um, is what the generalization of the conical point is. 
Uh, and I mean, the answer is that it's kind of hard to guess. The main thing is that, you know, this is uh, what you call a discriminant point. It comes where you pick up some singularity in this family, in this linear system that you're carrying in. So I don't know, I always just draw it as a mess because as far as I know, it's usually what it is. Um, so, you know, I have some complicated, maybe, uh, I have some complicated discriminant locus here, which is corresponding to the singular fibers away from the boundary uh, of the mirror family. Um, so the whole question uh, I want to ask is, like, open-ended question, although there's been a lot said about it, is, okay, we were talking about these monodromy transformations up here, and we had the monodromy autoequivalence formula. So how much can you extract for these kind of more complicated situations? Um, so actually, I, I don't think we really want to get into this today. Um, I mean, let me say, there is, in a sense, the question I just posed is like totally solved. Um, so some remarks in here. Um, actually, maybe just one remark. Um, so, Generalization, or our generalization of this auto equivalence formula, or what I call it, this like uh, spherical shape by the structure sheet we posed with x starting with y. Oh, x1, and uh, x2. So the generalization of this relation. General torque parameter spaces uh, was given by physicists like Justin Walker. I think sometime around 2009, paper was written as well. Uh, it's a physics paper, but it's a very mathematically friendly physics paper. So I don't want to get into this stuff if you're kind of around the right category of orbit. This is generated along the subsequent course of great restriction. Um, so the rough idea uh, I mean the rough idea is essentially okay you know there's this mirror complex moduli space this compact compact moduli space here um, and then the idea is roughly that if I look at the one dimensional strata of the boundary um, and this is like one dimensional stratum of the torque variety uh, and so it looks a lot like a P1 or an orbital P1. So if I just restrict my attention to these one-dimensional strata, then the picture looks a lot like the point. Okay. Um, and here, okay, I said I have this complicated discriminant local with singular fibers, so you can hope that it intersects nicely here, so that you only have like a controlled powerful point. So we really kind of only look at the asymptotics of this global picture that we have. Maybe kind of philosophically related to why I ended up using mirror map. Um, you really only look at the boundary of the moduli space here. Um, and then, so you hope that there's, or you say, okay, well, there should be auto equivalences corresponding to these monodromy transformations with some singular point. So, in terms of like the questions that we were talking about earlier, that's like the inspiration is to look at these monodromy transformations from one dimensional strata. Of the mirror family, um, but yeah, like in terms of the conversations we were, we were having earlier, you don't ever actually prove anything in this business by actually making that, by proving that statement and then proving homological mirror symmetry. So that's the rough idea, that's the motivation for where these autoequivalences relations come from. Um, but that said, the actual proof that Hurston Walker gave is a pure pre-model statement. Um, so they construct auto equivalence of the drive category and then construct auto equivalence of simulations, which generalize this point of regression. Um, the GKZ determinant. What'd you say? This is also the GKZ determinant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I didn't use that word, even though I really should. I don't know if they want to. But yeah, this this low side here, and then the way it intersects the boundary. 
So yeah, I, I don't want to get into it today, but on the first day I was going to actually like define things correctly and then we're going to talk about numerics and stuff like that. So that's important. Um, so do you get uh, all the relations of I1 of this space in this way? Uh, I don't know. We were talking about this before. Yeah. Um, I know very little about, I don't know what statements to make about, like, you know, so, so what I'm saying is, okay, we're going to represent the monodromy, you know, from here. So, I mean, there's two things. I, you know, I think I've asked you this question, like, every year, every time I meet you, like, what's going on in the interior here? I'm not claiming anything about that, so I'm just claiming to look at the asymptotics here. Um, and I'm not claiming anything about the actual monodromy representation, except that you can represent these trends. I don't know about faithfulness. I don't know about that. Um, yeah, so the question is, in a one-dimensional case, you have this, at least in this symbolic case, the yeah. accident that if you know two around the boundary components, the toric boundary components, yeah. you can infer the last one. Uh, infer the last one? It's the one on the continent. So the, you assume the multiplication is uh, infinite density. Right. Which is uh, obvious point. because you need to compactify sometimes by putting mass and monotony around it. Are you worried about more points here? Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I'm, uh, I'm wondering whether uh, you can, whether there is some reason to expect that the argument that works in one dimensional case yeah. can be uh, carried over to the higher dimensional case. So the no further relations come from the inside. Yeah, no. I, no, I don't want to claim. I don't know what's happening with the inside. Wait, why so. would that be? Why would that? I mean, because like. Have stuff from the inside, right? That yeah. It's just one dimension. I know. There could be an accident. Yeah. Oh. So in, in a few explicit examples, something comes from the inside. Oh, I, I can see how you would make, like, you take a gener generic meridian and you start degenerating the meridian as it goes to the boundary and breaks into, like, a bunch of, like, meridians circling around something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's. Um, like because the monotony would stay constant around like meridians and yeah. uh, So yeah, actually, I mean, one thing I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself in terms of like my story here. Um, so uh, maybe this is like a side remark here, which I'll just throw out there. Just a side remark. Um, this was this. You know, this, this general kind of cartoon here I drew here is supposed to be a complex moduli space of some, you know, corresponding to some floppy element in a, in a torque variety. Um, what I was saying, okay, you can also think of this global mirror family as being like the mirror of just the torque variety itself. Okay, so let's delete that for now in some sense. Um, if you've worked with mirrors of torque varieties, though, you know that's a little off because mirrors of torque varieties are always one dimensional in those inverse models. So somehow, if you're looking at the mirror of a torque variety, what's going to happen is a lot of colors here. Um, you know, the the one-dimensional Landau Ginsberg model will be like a one-dimensional path in this moduli space, and in practice, it'll usually connect uh, like a Landau Ginsberg point in a large complex structure of a point. So the actual Landau Ginsberg model of mirror of a torque variety crosses through the interior and pick up singular fibers where you can intersect this locus. So the thing that you really work with when you're considering mirrors of torque varieties and things like that definitely sees vanishing cycles and stuff coming from the interior. It's just the particular thing I was looking at over here is just saying, okay, there's kind of a side story where you can just uh, look at monodrome and fibers, but then you only look at that asymptotic thing. So I'll say a little bit more on Thursday about how to match this. You only meet like uh, the irreducible components of the monogamy generically, right? You have the divisors of the, like the irreducible divisors of the GPD determinant, but if you take the generic like one, like P1, you're just going to meet in the interior just yeah, the, so there's, the irreducible there's ones. A, I don't know if this is following up. There's a few kind of, when they say the GKZ determinant, there's the GKZ determinant and there's the GKZ determinant. And uh, the, there's like the part on the interior and then there's the part on the boundary. So it's in the full glory of this discriminant locus, it's very like irreducible and kind of keeps, keeps collapsing the boundary. The interior part 
uh, I believe it's here it is in the Oracle Contest and Illustration. And it's always rational. It has no rational singularities, but I, I don't think it's particularly one of our modern ones. Um, anyways, it was getting a little, that was more, yeah. it's kind of more planned for Thursday. So. Um, So this is a, 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 a awkward question. So in one email, I was asked to talk for an hour and a half, and then a, I think I'm also scheduled for two. So uh, what do you guys? I, I mean, how do you feel? I'm I'm a, I don't know if you can tell. I'm sick. I drank like a ton of cough syrup before this talk. So I, I'm you know I'm both simultaneously tired and I could talk for like six more hours. So <laughs> it's up to you guys. I won't remember any of it. Um, so um, should I stop here and then we'll just pick up? On Thursday? I think maybe, uh, like yeah. Okay. I think this is probably a reasonable stopping point. point. Yeah, yeah, and then on Thursday, I'll like actually do this stuff kind of in detail and actually construct these things instead of talking about them. Okay. Um, does anybody have more questions to call in other than the ones we already asked them during the talk? Which we get them? Questions for Greg? All of them during the talk. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.